A very good morning to everyone. This is Pandit Kumar, student, Karnataka State Law University's Law School, Hubal. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all the dignitaries to the special lecture series conducted by Research Center in Democracy and Constitutional Government and KSLU's Law School. As any other auspicious occasion, let's commence by invoking the blessings of Lord Almighty, for which I request Ms. Lavanya Udupi, student, KSLU's Law School, to sing the invocation song. Pandi Sugura We all feel blessed indeed. I request Ms. Rukmini Patil, student, KSLU's Law School, to introduce the resource person and welcome the gathering. A very good morning to everyone. This is Rukmini Patil, student, KSLU's Law School, Hubali. It gives me immense pleasure to cordially welcome all the dignitaries and students to the special lecture series conducted by the Research Center in Democracy and Constitutional Government and KSLU's Law School, Hubali on the topic, impact of constitutional theories upon constitutional interpretation. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Professor Dr. P. Ishwar Bhatt, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Karnataka State Law University to this special lecture series. I welcome you, sir. Thank you. I, al I also welcome Sir Mohammed Zubair N. K.S. Registrar KSLU to the event. I welcome you, sir. I heartily welcome Professor Dr. C.S. Patil, Head Research Center and Professor of Law. I welcome you, sir. I cordially welcome Professor Dr. Ratna R. Bharam Gowder, Dean and Director, KSLU's Law School. I welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. And Professor Dr. G.B. Patil, Registrar Evaluation, KSLU. I welcome you, sir. 
Last but not the least, I also extend a warm welcome to all the faculty members and students for being a part of this lecture. Also, it's an honor to introduce the resource person for today's special lecture series, Professor Dr. P. Ishwar Bhatt. Born in 1955 at Padnur village, Puttur Taluk, uh, DK district, Karnataka, in an agricultural family, he had an early education in Padnur and Puttur and studied in Vivekananda College, Puttur and Udupi Law College. He had LLM degree from the University of Mysore with gold medal. He obtained MA degree in history. He got PhD degree in law from University of Mysore for the thesis on interrelationship among in fundamental rights in 1994. An LLD from National Law School of India University, Bengaluru in 2016 for the thesis on non-profit voluntary organizations law. He has 40 years of uh, teaching experience taught in M. Krishna Law College, Hassan from 1979 to 1982. PG Department of Law, Karnataka University, Dharwad from 1982 to 1984. Department of Studies of Law, University of Mysore from 1984 to 2011. And in West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata from 2011 to 2018. He served as Professor and Dean of Faculty of Law, University of Mysore, Acting Vice Chancellor of University of Mysore for four months and as Vice Chancellor of the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata from 2011 to 2018. He handled five research projects and guided 20 candidates for PhD successfully. He has specialization in and has taught constitutional law, administrative law, law and uh, social transformation, non-profit law, legal research methodology, intellectual property rights, and water law. He served as member of syndicate and academic council of several universities. He has a Fulbright Nehru visiting fellow and involved in co-teaching NPO law in Columbus Law School, Catholic University of America in 2010, Shastri visiting lecturer in 2009 at Queen's University, Kingston, Canada to teach comparative legal tradition. Salzburg Fellow in 1997 for undergoing a seminar course on American civilization. Shastri Research Faculty Awardee in 1992 for researching at York, Toronto and Ottawa Universities on language rights. He has presented papers in international conferences on third sector law at Toronto, Seoul, Jakarta, Beijing and Bangkok. He also presented a paper on mother tongue education at Kathmandu and on Indian constitutional development at Islamabad. He participated and presented papers in more than 100 national and international seminars. He has authored books on non-profit voluntary organization law, law and social transformation, fundamental rights and administrative liability, idea and methods of legal research, and published 115 research articles in national and international journals and books. His books entitled Harmful Superstitions and Legal Responses, Responses is under print. He has edited books under the titles Essays in Law, Constitutionalism and Constitutional Pluralism, International and Interstate Water Disputes and Law, Natural Resources Law, Kanunu Tatvagalu Matu Siddhantagalu, Kanunu Kannada. He, he has also authored book titled Reference of Bhagavad Gita in Judicial, Judicial Verdicts and Analysis. I now request Honorable Vice Chancellor, Karnataka State Law University, Professor Dr. P. Ishwar Bhatt to kindly address the participants. Please, sir. Thank you, Rukmini Patil, for um, uh, nice words of introduction. Professor uh, C.S. Patil, head of uh, the Center for uh, Research in uh, Constitutional Law and uh, Democratic Governance, and a uh, professor of uh, Karnataka State Law University, Professor uh, Ratna Paramagodar, Dean and Director of uh, 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 Karnataka State Law University Law School, Professor G.B. Patil, Registrar uh, Evaluation, Sri Mohammad Zubair, Registrar, all the faculty members, students, and invitees. It uh, gives me great pleasure in uh, sharing my thoughts on uh, this uh, topic impact of uh, constitutional theories on a constitutional interpretation. The Center is to be congratulated for organizing uh, various activities, including uh, 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 this particular uh, lecture. Perhaps uh, in the future also, there could be 
more number of uh, lectures on uh, various uh, issues about uh, uh, one election, one nation, one election, or on uh, uh, legal profession, uh, or about the amendment, social justice, etc. The center is uh, uh, busy in uh, uh, research activities. About uh, today's uh, theme, there is an impact of uh, constitutional theories on uh, constitutional interpretation. Let me involve in discussion. See, uh, constitutional theories are sometimes uh, taught in a separate manner as if uh, they are nothing to do with the constitutional practice. And a uh, constitutional practice is uh, sometimes uh, taught in a such a way that uh, uh, it is not connected with the constitutional theory. But uh, that uh, type of approach is uh, not appropriate because uh, when we involve in a constitutional uh, interpretation, we are actually involving in a mind boggling uh, theoretical uh, discourse. There is a little, uh, there is a rich literature in a constitutional theory produced by great thinkers and scholars, both the ancient and modern world over through multidisciplinary study of a political science, jurisprudence, economics, history, etc. What are theories? Theories are basically propositions based on a reason. They are rooted in our social experiences and they competitively appeal for acceptance in the marketplace of ideas. Marketplace of ideas is full of uh, uh, alternative uh, theories, alternative propositions. And which theory is uh, most appealing, most appropriate, and which is uh, usable, or a combination of uh, which of the theories would be appropriate? These are left to the persons uh, who are uh, uh, going through those uh, theories. See, in the field of uh, constitutional law, uh, constitutional theories are relating to the very formation of state, purpose of state. Why? state has come into existence. What is its origin? What is its growth? What are its functions and responsibilities? And uh, what are its uh, contributions in the form of uh, good governance, protection of human rights, promotion of welfare, harmony, etc. On uh, various uh, issues, uh, so many concepts, so many doctrines, and so many theories are uh, put forward. Further, there is also an idea that uh, constitution is a social document. See. A sociology of a constitution is a uh, uh, worth to be probed into because a uh, constitution is uh, basically born in the bosom of uh, the society, and uh, uh, the uh, people's participation or people's uh, uh, pet uh, ideas or their perception, their uh, uh, expectations or their aspirations, all these enter into the constitution making process and uh, application of uh, the constitution. That's why by saying that a uh, constitution is a social document, a uh, big uh, area of uh, sociological jurisprudence is abroad. Because uh, how best uh, through constitution, social transformation is to be brought or social uh, reform is to be brought. About this, uh, the scholars will be dealing. See, about the uh, constitutional theories, uh, I mean, use of constitutional theories and constitutional interpretation, we come across uh, uh, some uh, prominent cases, you know, you know, most prominent uh, or landmark cases uh, uh, in Indian constitutional jurisprudence, for example, uh, Keshavananda or uh, S.R. Bumai, Samata, or a case of Putta Swami or Indra Swami, or in you know, various other cases, or uh, the latest case, there's a uh, uh, justice case of Putta Swami case. In all these cases, we come across uh, in-depth uh, theoretical discussion uh, about uh, political and uh, social philosophy, jurisprudence, and uh, uh, on uh, specific uh, concepts and uh, doctrines, uh, there is uh, much uh, discussion. Further, the judicial verdicts uh, theorize certain uh, propositions. And uh, about the judicial uh, verdicts also, about uh, the trend analysis or uh, about uh, the analysis of uh, the uh, judicial contribution, et cetera. 
number of uh, theories are uh, spinned and viewed and uh, brought out uh, to the people by the academia. That's why uh, between the judiciary and academia, uh, there is always uh, that kind of a dialogue. And uh, between constitutional theory and uh, uh, constitutional interpretation also, there is uh, that kind of a dialogue. See, whether theories are relevant at all, whether constitutional theories uh, uh, are to be brought or they are to be used in the course of constitutional interpretation, there is a question uh, which uh, takes us uh, to a controversy. Richard Posner, a very eminent uh, judge of uh, uh, American court, is of a uh, very categorical view that constitutional theories uh, do not have and should not have any scope for in a con any scope for a constitutional interpretation at all, because uh, judges uh, do not rely upon the theories, and uh, when a judges uh, uh, act on the basis of uh, their intuition or uh, their sense of uh, justice, then uh, no theory will be coming to their rescue, or uh, th no theory is uh, used by them. Further, many of uh, the theories are merely uh, argumentative, prescriptive, and they are not uh, that much uh, uh, based on very scientific study about uh, the social data. When uh, so many of uh, the constitutional theories put forward by the academic community are uh, merely reflections on uh, judgments, or uh, they are putting forward various uh, arguments which could be used in a constitutional interpretation. They are uh, only serving the lawyers and they are not serving the judges because they did not help in knowing what is the social, economic, or cultural position. Thus, uh, many of uh, the ac academic writings uh, which uh, uh, produce uh, constitutional theories are uh, merely academification of juridical thinking. They are merely academic vacations and uh, they're not uh, providing a real input. That is why we uh, should not rely upon a constitutional theories in the course of constitutional interpretation. Further, it is a dangerous also because constitutional theories are uh, diverse. Uh, they have different propositions. Uh, for example, uh, it may be advocating the cause of liberalism or it may be advocating a uh, say conservatism it may be uh, arguing for socialism it may be arguing for a feminism or a, it may be a reflection of a critical uh, race theory or a, it might be uh, something about a, a reservation policy which is based upon some uh, sociological jurisprudence etc but uh, it is not uh, something uh, which uh, provides uh, a very objective criteria that can be relied upon in the course of constitutional interpretation. That is why it is uh, dangerous to rely upon the constitutional theories. That, that's why judges should not bother about constitutional theories. They should uh, just uh, bother about uh, uh, their business that uh, they have to interpret the constitution, uh, uh, the constitutional text and uh, uh, the case law or uh, all the uh, uh, writings uh, about the case law, etc. These could be used, but uh, theories as such do not have or should not have any place for a constitutional interpretation. This is uh, the view of uh, 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 Richard Posner. But uh, uh, this uh, negative approach about the uh, relevance of constitutional theory to uh, towards a constitutional interpretation uh, has been a uh, uh, countered or rejected by other scholars. Thomas uh, Baker uh, points out uh, various uh, advantages of uh, using a constitutional theory. See, always uh, theories uh, provide for certain amount of uh, clarity. When uh, the data is huge, suppose a case law, hundreds of a case law, or uh, uh, voluminous uh, writings, uh, whether by commentators or uh, in the constitutional assembly debates, or uh, uh, so many other data is available, or uh, 
uh, various uh, factual details are also placed before the court. Then, in order to uh, classify, summarize, and arrive at a certain propositions on the basis of uh, induction, inductive logic, it is uh, essential that uh, some uh, theorization should take place. Theories uh, provide for, uh, uh, say, classification and systematization of study. Uh, in the field of uh, uh, research methodology, we come across uh, the relation between uh, facts and theory. Facts are enormous. And uh, uh, when uh, the facts are to be managed with uh, certain uh, theoretical propositions, actually that kind of uh, approach of a theory becomes uh, very much essential and it is unavoidable. See, theories uh, provide for alternative arguments. Uh, further, uh, when uh, certain theories are put forward, then uh, uh, countering those theories, uh, there could be some other theories. That's a uh, theories uh, cannot be simply discarded as uh, irrelevant. If a liberalism is there, then uh, conservatism might be there. Or uh, if there is a conservatism, then uh, there is a socialist uh, ideas. Then uh, comparing uh, all these things, which is uh, the most appropriate about this uh, right of a choice could be there from the side of uh, the judge. That's a uh, uh, theory is uh, when I uh, provide for uh, certain uh, justifications and uh, in a uh, controversial issues, uh, they provide for uh, certain uh, arguments in the field of uh, legal culture based upon uh, people's uh, understanding, etc. It is uh, quite appropriate that theories uh, uh, will have to be used and uh, uh, David Strauss goes to the extent of uh, saying that uh, theories are comparable to uh, rules of grammar or a scientific formula through which uh, we can make certain uh, evaluation, we can uh, decipher which is good, which is bad, and uh, uh, thus uh, the theories uh, play a very important role according to these scholars. Richard Fallon uh, another uh, eminent uh, constitutional jurist, she points out that constitutional theories, which uh, might be uh, both descriptive and prescriptive, refer to the consensus among the theories that constitutional theory should conform to some requirements for people's acceptance. Uh, of course, there is argument uh, by Postner that uh, because of a uh, number of uh, constitutional theories, the judge will be put into confusion. How to select the most appropriate uh, constitutional theory? Which uh, theory could be regarded as a, an appropriate one? Richard Fallon uh, gives uh, this answer, that uh, if theories are uh, conform to certain uh, standards or uh, criteria, then we can say that uh, such a theory is uh, acceptable. There is a, uh, how far uh, it is a, uh, Promoting maintenance of rule of law. That's uh, the first question. Then uh, how far uh, it gives a fair opportunity for a political democracy. Preservation of a political democracy is a uh, one cardinal goal. And how far uh, the theory at hand is uh, promoting this particular principle. Thirdly, to protect a morally and politically acceptable set of substantial rights. See, there are uh, so many substantial rights uh, that are to be protected. And uh, uh, it is uh, essential that morally and politically, when a uh, uh, protection of uh, these uh, substantial rights uh, uh, becomes uh, uh, essential, then uh, these uh, theories uh, should help in that task. If uh, these uh, three criteria are fulfilled, then of course, uh, theories uh, are acceptable. That's a, by taking this a litmus test, it is a possible to reject some of the theories. For example, a conservatism as a, a constitutional theory can be rejected. Or a, a, say, a glorification of a, a natural right to property as a constitutional theory, that can be rejected. Uh, suppose that there is a a constitutional theory relating to feminism, constitutional feminism. 
or feminist constitutionalism, then of course uh, it may be conforming to these requirements. See, this uh, uh, theories uh, are relevant and they uh, serve the purpose of constitutional interpretation according to these uh, scholars. Uh, of course, uh, how to classify theories? Uh, see, Thomas uh, Baker uh, classifies uh, theories into two categories. Uh, there is a text-based theories and the other is a practice-based theories. Text-based theories are uh, uh, theories which are relating to interpretation of uh, the constitution by making use of the text of the constitution. These are text-based theories. For example, originalism is a text-based theory. Uh, then, uh, 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 democracy reinforcement is a text-based theory. There is a John Ellis' famous book, Democracy and Distrust. There he points out that uh, every constitutional interpretation should result in reinforcement of a representative democracy. If it is uh, not doing that, then it is uh, not uh, serving the purpose of uh, the constitution. Because uh, uh, the central aim of uh, a constitution is to ensure that a uh, democracy flourishes. That's uh, uh, the text-based theory in the form of, uh, uh, say, promotion of a democracy is a uh, one form of a uh, theory which uh, can be used. Then structuralism is uh, another uh, approach which is also based upon a text of uh, the constitution. See, the constitutional structure uh, might be providing for separation of uh, powers between uh, three organs of government. Or it might be providing for division of powers between a central government and state government. Or it might be providing for a recognition of a, a several uh, fundamental rights. And uh, among fundamental rights, there could be interactions, there could be mutual relations, or uh, there could be relations between uh, fundamental rights and the direct principles of state policy. Thus, a textual structure of the constitution enables the judge to interpret the constitution by taking into account the aspirations behind the constitution, which are expressed in the form of the text and the structure of the constitution. Thus, a theory of separation of powers, federalism, or uh, even a secularism. Secularism is also one uh, kind of, uh, I mean, uh, one aspect of uh, structuralism. Now, suppose uh, a society is a multi-religious society uh, or a multicultural society. People have different faiths, different beliefs, and different uh, 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 types of uh, uh, worship form. Then the social structure demands that there shall be recognition of equal religious freedom of all. So, structuralism results in a recognition of secularism itself. Thus, a text of the constitution is a, the best starting point for a constitutional interpretation. Uh, of course, uh, there could be various uh, other uh, resources or other inputs in the form of history or a common law practice or uh, precedents and so many other things. But uh, text is uh, the most important uh, factor. Thus, uh, text-based theories uh, are uh, several, uh, which are uh, uh, more and more focusing on the these theories, democracy and uh, constitutionalism. Uh, this is also text-based uh, theory. And uh, what is the relation between a democracy and a constitutionalism? Of course, uh, democracy uh, should uh, gather support from uh, 
constitutionalism and uh, it should uh, uh, ultimately aim at constitutional form of government wherein welfare of the people protection of human rights and uh, execution of uh, the social transformation function all should take place thus a democracy is, is an instrument to implement the constitutional constitutionalism ideas what are the ideas of constitutionalism uh, there we come across uh, uh, different uh, propositions for example uh, joseph raz uh, points out that the basic moral principles are relating to justice human rights or welfare are to be promoted through constitution then uh, uh, there are uh, other views uh, frank michael man uh, points out that uh, republicanism is to be ensured through constitutionalism that is the criteria so same idea of a constitutionalism may have different uh, types of propositions when it is connected with the democracy that's a uh, how a constitutional pr provision is to be interpreted uh, that is to be decided on the basis of the implications uh, arising from constitutionalism as well as its relation with the democracy that uh, uh, we find that uh, this uh, text based theories text based theories uh, play a very prominent role in a constitutional interpretation see uh, structure of uh, the constitution may be providing for a uh, different parts and it might be providing for a preamble yes in so far as the indian constitution is concerned there is a every inspiring preamble we the people of india here we solemnly resolve to constitute india into sovereign socialist democratic uh, democratic republic in order to ensure to its citizens justice social economic political liberty of thought expression and faith equality of status and opportunity dignity of individual fraternity and uh, unity of the nation see all these uh, goals or objectives have certain uh, relations with the various uh, parts of the constitution for example whole of uh, federalism is uh, connected with the idea of a uh, unity of the nation as well as uh, ensuring a uh, justice social economic political and so many other things democratic form of government there also how uh, various uh, specific attributes like a uh, justice equality liberty etc shall promote that about that we get input that's the structure of uh, the constitution which uh, provides for uh, different uh, parts and uh, connects all these uh, parts through a brilliant uh, preamble provides uh, for a theoretical application of where is a uh, values enshrined in a preamble in the course of interpretation of uh, the constitution what is uh, the big impact of uh, using uh, the small word dignity dignity of individual in a preamble to the gamut or to the uh, field of uh, article 21 of the constitution there's a right to life and personal liberty right to life shall be dignified life personal liberty is uh, something that uh, ought to gather support from a uh, dignity whole idea of uh, privacy and uh, so many other uh, brilliant ideas relating to positive rights were gathered from a uh, dignity there's a uh, a dignified life will not, will not be possible unless a, a person has access to various uh, positive things like a uh, food or uh, uh, say education means of livelihood or uh, health environment and so many other things so many unnamed rights were brought just on the basis of a connection between dignity of individual and the right guaranteed under article 21 of the constitution uh, this uh, 
the constitutional uh, theory that uh, the goals enshrined in the preamble of the constitution are to be executed through the constitution, through specific constitutional provisions and implementation of those constitutional provisions. This proposition points out that textual theories have a lot of significance in the constitutional interpretation. Apart from uh, this uh, text-based uh, methods of constitutional interpretation or theories of constitutional interpretation, we come across uh, practice-based theories. What is a practice-based theory? See, on the basis of uh, social experience and intellectual discourse or uh, academic uh, ideas, some uh, practice-based approaches have evolved in the juridical world and uh, outside the juridical world also, not necessarily in the juridical world. Of course, uh, courts also come out with their doctrines or uh, theories or propositions. But uh, here I am uh, more focusing on uh, constitutional theories which are not propounded by the judiciary because uh, judiciary did not uh, propound the constitutional theories or at least it stated uh, repeatedly that, see, formation of a constitutional theory or a adherence to constitutional theory is a not our concern. Interpreting the constitution is a, our concern and it, it is the task that uh, we are doing. Uh, we are not uh, uh, so much uh, favoring uh, this uh, theory or that theory, this idea or that idea. Because uh, uh, our uh, commitment is to the notion of uh, constitutionalism. When a constitutionalism governs, there is a no place for other isms. Other isms are simply absorb in constitutionalism. That's a liberalism or a conservatism, socialism, or a, a natural law idea, or various other types of isms or notions or arguments. Uh, these might be taken into consideration by the judiciary, but a judiciary is not uh, strictly adhering to any of those theories. Thus, uh, it adopts what can be called eclectic approach to the constitutional interpretation. That which is uh, most appropriate, that which is uh, uh, promoting the spirit of the constitution, or uh, that which is uh, uh, providing for uh, a combination of uh, uh, wisdom, of uh, several uh, propositions. That is to be taken into consideration. That is the idea of eclectism. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chintam Chandrachud, in a, uh, one of uh, the thought-provoking articles in a uh, handbook of uh, uh, constitution, Oxford Handbook of Indian Constitution, he uh, explains about uh, this uh, eclectism as uh, the central approach of uh, the uh, Supreme Court in a constitutional interpretation. We'll come to that aspect of uh, eclectism later. But uh, here, about uh, practice-based uh, theories, let me point out that uh, on the basis of uh, uh, intellectual uh, discourse or uh, academic uh, discussion or a uh, juristic uh, exercise, so many scholars like uh, Ronald Dworkin, or uh, Bruce Ackerman, or uh, uh, various uh, other scholars, David Strauss, or Philip Bobbitt, etc. Uh, they have uh, come, out, come out with certain uh, theories which uh, could be put into practice in the course of constitutional interpretation. That is why practice-based theories. Uh, judiciary may use it in a practice. Uh, uh, See, the academicians have propounded those uh, theories on the basis of uh, the uh, practice, uh, either uh, academic practice or the judicial practice or uh, their own uh, uh, jurisprudential thinking. What does uh, Ronald Dworkin point out? He points out that America's uh, moral sale of equal citizenship is uh, something becomes a uh, central. And he argues that 
fidelity to the constitution demands that judges make a contemporary judgments based on a political morality see a constitution stands for a, some a moral values thus a, the constitutional interpreter should uh, uh, be loyal to the task of upholding those uh, primary principles of a political morality what are principles of political morality a good democracy then uh, uh, ensuring a uh, uh, human rights promoting a uh, welfare avoidance of uh, arbitrary uh, type of uh, exercise of uh, power and so many aspects of uh, good things are to be considered as a uh, principles of political morality so he brings a uh, morality to the very heart of uh, the constitution law and uh, justifies that so many unenumerated rights could be brought because of uh, the moral principles see whether in a 20th century or a 21st century uh, whether we can say that uh, racial discrimination is uh, appropriate and uh, that could be practiced in uh, uh, any schools the answer is no because it is uh, going against uh, the fundamental principle of morality political morality itself similarly a woman uh, who doesn't want to continue her pregnancy uh, because of her own uh, volition or her own uh, reason uh, should decide uh, about uh, the uh, uh, choice uh, whether she should uh, continue the abortion or uh, she should terminate uh, because a fetus is a uh, not a person as such uh, in that case uh, the woman has a liberty thus uh, morally speaking she has uh, that uh, right thus uh, uh, various uh, judgments of uh, these sorts could be conforming to the idea of a uh, political morality according to uh, ronald dwork bruce ackerman points out that uh, a constitutional interpretation uh, should uh, take into consideration the people's uh, determination people have uh, decided in the making of the constitution or founding of the constitution that uh, this shall be the constitution we the people of united states of america they had uh, constituted a constitution similarly we the people uh, in india had constituted a constitution and uh, we are uh, continuing that uh, constitution so this is uh, a political event where people uh, express uh, their uh, uh, voice in uh, making the constitution then there are uh, subsequent uh, instances where uh, people amended the constitution through their own additions for example civil war was uh, a big event in america soon after uh, civil war people changed their attitude the nation is to be kept intact on the question of slavery on the question of racial discrimination the country should not be divided there shall be effective protection of all the basic human rights to all the citizens and states are bound by all those responsibilities this is uh, the amendment uh, which a uh, people brought that's uh, in their thinking uh, that's uh, that was a kind of a political movement social movement similarly when a new deal uh, era witnessed declaration of uh, some of uh, the welfare legislations as unconstitutional people uh, uh, actually felt uh, disappointed by the judicial approach and this was expressed in the form of uh, some uh, uh, political development and uh, the threat by the uh, president roosevelt about the uh, independence of the judiciary ultimately resulted in the carolina products case where uh, footnote number 4 pointed out that judiciary will not interfere in a matter relating to economic uh, policies 
it is uh, only relating to the constitutional issues other than economic policies uh, that uh, the uh, court will decide. Uh, that's a uh, Bruce uh, Ackerman uh, points out that uh, creative constitutional achievements uh, have taken place uh, through people's participation. And the judiciary has to take a cognizance of these things. See, Dor Dorkin says, don't rely exactly on text, rely on a political morality. Then uh, Bruce Ackerman says, you rely on uh, the people's viewpoint. David Strauss, uh, uh, another scholar, he points out that uh, uh, rely upon the common law approach because uh, common law is a resourceful uh, sphere of uh, legal evolution. Uh, legal principles have evolved uh, in the area of uh, common law from a precedent to precedent. Freedom uh, went on uh, expanding. Uh, when uh, in England, it was a common law which uh, provided for uh, all these rights. In uh, America, the constitutional jurisprudence uh, was built on the basis of uh, precedents. So uh, constitutional interpretation is to be done by making use of uh, the precedents. Because in practice, the judiciary takes cognizance of uh, those uh, uh, principles, th those uh, principles or practices. Of course, uh, there was uh, one uh, eminent scholar, uh, uh, scholar uh, by name uh, Akhil Amar Deed. Uh, uh, he pointed out that, uh, or he just uh, gave an advice to the constitutional students in uh, his uh, classroom that. Uh, uh, for uh, understanding the constitution, just uh, go through the case law, just go through the judgments. You keep your uh, text aside because uh, in practice, it is not a text that is used. It is uh, the precedents that are used. Of course, uh, that is uh, one uh, uh, method of studying the constitution. Uh, we cannot say that uh, that may be very uh, exact uh, approach uh, with which we can agree because uh, text is a, a very good starting point for uh, uh, reasoning or for uh, uh, bringing up uh, uh, new meanings, etc. See, a common law has uh, sometimes uh, dealt with uh, uh, various uh, approaches like a uh, uh, say uh, uh, this uh, uh, natural law idea, etc. And uh, uh, of course, uh, Thomas uh, Philip Bobbitt considers a constitutional interpretation as a intellectual syncretism or combination of a text, original understanding, history, tradition, structure, etc. Then. Robert Bork pointed out that uh, in a constitutional democracy, the moral content of law must be given uh, the morality of the framer of the legislator, never by the morality of the judge. What was the morality of uh, the uh, original uh, constitutional maker that is to be taken into consideration? Then we come across uh, uh, another important uh, text-based, uh, I mean, uh, practice-based uh, theory that is a natural law idea or natural law ideology. See, natural law has uh, provided a rich uh, philosophical inputs for the judges and thinkers and uh, uh, about uh, the nature of uh, state, purpose of state, or uh, basis and functions of public institutions, and about uh, the concepts of uh, justice, e liberty, equality, etc. Natural law has uh, provided uh, uh, varieties of uh, meanings, varieties of understandings. but. Uh, the problem with the natural law is that natural law has uh, uh, been used uh, for uh, so many opposing uh, arguments. For example, uh, natural law argument was uh, put forward. 
to justify patriarchal discrimination between a man and woman see in a the famous uh, case uh, uh, there is a bradwell bradwell versus illinois decided in 1872 there uh, the court considered that uh, uh, in the uh, notion of a uh, uh, natural law or natural rights woman is uh, different from man that is why recognition of her uh, right to practice in a court of law cannot be recognized uh, see natural law was used to uh, say support uh, gender discrimination similarly about a uh, racial discrimination also or about uh, upholding the cause of uh, slavery also natural law was used see natural law stood for justice equality liberty etc that is uh, so many ideal propositions were there but it was also used for uh, upholding the uh, practice of uh, slavery practice of uh, gender discrimination or a practice of uh, upholding property right or a sanctity of a contract and uh, concerning a payment of a just compensation and so many other things sanctity of contract etc it is a natural law that was used that's a natural law <coughs> is not a dependable type of a theory which could a uh, uh, provide a uh, uh, say an appropriate guidance to the constitutional interpretation uh, of course uh, natural law arguments uh, uh, were put forward for uh, so many such a uh, dubious uh, causes uh, now uh, apart from natural law uh, there are uh, use of uh, liberalism conservatism uh, then uh, uh, socialism etc uh, of course uh, liberalism uh, dominated in the, the early uh, uh, sphere then we come across uh, uh, the dominance of uh, uh, conservatism and uh, uh, of course uh, at a different uh, stages of uh, american constitutional development and such a uh, uh, developments to place of course uh, uh, these are uh, uh, the theories uh, based on a practice now how constitutional theory is applied in a constitutional interpretation in india about this uh, i am uh, coming to discussion see one important uh, thing that uh, we should uh, notice about uh, the indian judiciary is approached relating to constitutional theory is that the judiciary has uh, not been fettered by any of uh, the specific constitutional theories it uh, goes to the credit of uh, the judiciary or we should uh, lord or we should uh, uh, we should uh, uh, actually uh, Uh, admire about uh, the balanced uh, approach or uh, about uh, the impartial approach or uh, uh, the approach of uh, keeping above all theories and uh, uh, committing itself to the basic ideas of a constitution that's a, a wonderful approach where we come across a combination of uh, uh, different uh, propositions but uh, not adherence to any of the specific theories see uh, use of the text use of history structure context purpose spirit and precedents everything is uh, done but uh, uh, about the uh, theory the court's approach ever since uh, ak gopalan is that we are not a uh, committing ourselves to any of the specific theories of course uh, even today 
the dominant approach is uh, not to abide by any of uh, the specific uh, constitutional theory. Even though natural law and uh, sociological jurisprudence, etc., have cast their own influence, still the courts have uh, excluded the harmful effects of natural law. See, uh, so the iniquitous or uh, a uh, highly dangerous uh, types of uh, natural law arguments are uh, simply rejected and uh, they, they have not been uh, entertained. Uh, then even about uh, sociological jurisprudence also, the court has been uh, more adhering to the text of the constitution, constitution or uh, it uh, uses the text of uh, the constitution. In a A.K. Gopalan case, the first major case on a uh, constitutional interpretation, Justice uh, Patanjali Shastri uh, made a uh, one important observation. Uh, he was uh, not uh, ready to stretch the meaning of the phrase procedure established by law to entail an immutable and universal principle of natural justice. See, uh, there was an argument that uh, the word words uh, procedure established by law uh, should be understood in a due process uh, sense and uh, it should reflect universal principles of natural justice because uh, through law, justice is to be promoted. This was the argument. But uh, 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 of course, uh, uh, he agreed that a preamble to the constitution has uh, some relevance in the constitutional interpretation of uh, uh, fundamental rights. About that, there is no doubt. But he was not ready to uh, make use of the word justice in a uh, uh, preamble to superimpose uh, all those uh, notions of justice upon a procedure as such by law. Because a procedure as such by law is a, a valid piece of uh, uh, law. That is all. Thus, uh, uh, he declined to say that uh, language of the provisions uh, should be stretched to square with uh, this or that constitutional theory in, disreg in disregard of the cardinal rule of interpretation of uh, any enactment, constitutional or other, that in spirit, no less than its uh, intendment should be collected, primarily from the natural meaning of the words used. So, interpret the constitution according to the natural meaning of the words used, and uh, don't follow either this theory or that theory, and uh, fidelity to the text rather than loyalty to constitutional theory was a, an approach that was a, initiated by him and it was a pragmatic approach and uh, it uh, remained uh, a dominant approach uh, for a long time and even today that is a, a very important uh, proposition. In a Subodh Gopal case, uh, Justice uh, Das uh, reiterated uh, what uh, Justice Patanjali Shastri said and he pointed out that I say with the utmost humility that the proper method of approach is to adopt the golden rule of uh, construction referred to in the judgment uh, rendered by Justice Patanjali Shastri and uh, uh, not to start off with uh, any kind of assumption that our constitution must be regarded as having uh, reproduced either this or that doctrine. Thus, uh, uh, not uh, cl clinging to any of the specific doctrine was the proposition. Uh, the same idea was uh, projected by Justice uh, P. Jaganmohan Reddy in a Keshwananda case. Uh, he was a uh, member of uh, the majority uh, group. Uh, there he pointed out, this court is uh, not concerned with any political philosophy, nor has it its own philosophy, nor are judges entitled to write into their judgments the prejudices or prevalent moral attitudes of the times, except to judge the legislation in the light of the felt needs of the society for which it was enacted and in accordance with the constitution. That was a very categorical observation by Justice Jaganmohan Reddy that uh, keep away the doctrines or theories, uh, just uh, uh, interpret the constitution according to the natural meaning. So the mainstream of constitutional jurisprudence 
from a Gopalan to present day is a uh, adherence to this uh, proposition. Uh, this is a preliminary remark I am uh, making. Uh, of course, uh, 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 about the uh, uh, implications of a natural law in a constitutional interpretation, uh, uh, I am taking up uh, uh, further uh, uh, discussion. See, uh, in a Gopalan case, the idea that a component of a justice should be part and parcel of a procedure research by law, by virtue of a natural law idea, was rejected. And uh, uh, of course, natural law uh, is uh, something uh, that was uh, taken into consideration in uh, some of the property right cases. Even in a Subodh Gopal case, uh, we come across a reference to property right as a natural right. There, uh, judges, uh, uh, yes, one of the judges uh, points out that uh, under uh, Article 19 of uh, the Constitution, so many natural rights are uh, recognized. And uh, among those natural rights, right to property is also a natural right. Hence, a uh, payment of compensation is a must. That was uh, the observation by judge, uh, by the Subodh Gopal judgment. You find that during the first one and a half decades of uh, uh, constitutional development, pro-property approach was adopted. And uh, this uh, natural right uh, proposition had uh, uh, its uh, uh, own uh, consequence. Uh, although I'm saying that uh, in a Gopalan case, uh, that approach was adopted, that uh, uh, all these uh, doctrines are to be kept away. In a property right cases, by taking into consideration a natural right theory of a property, much damage was done to zamindari abolition law or so many other agrarian reforms. So there was also a negative lesson in our constitutional development that uh, uh, natural law or natural right uh, arguments uh, may be causing uh, some harm. But uh, that was uh, for a very brief period of uh, 10 or 15 years. Once uh, Keshavan on the case came, okay, there's a, uh, of course, uh, uh, in a earlier case, uh, there's a Golaknath. Uh, natural right uh, theory was uh, the central idea. And even Justice Hidayatullah was also harping on a natural right uh, theory of a property. But uh, after uh, so many amendments, the damaging effect of a uh, property right was uh, removed. It's a harmful consequence or a harmful potentiality was removed. And ultimately, the right to property itself was removed from a part of the constitution in 1978. See, in a case we come across uh, uh, this issue, whether a natural law uh, can be uh, used as a, a method of a constitutional interpretation or in the course of a interpreting the constitution, whether uh, the natural law ideology can be used. See, one thing we should remember that uh, the basic proposition in the case that uh, there is there are uh, certain uh, basic structures, there are certain uh, parts in the constitution, provisions in the constitution, which constitute a basic structure of the constitution, which uh, cannot be amended by a temporary majority. This itself is a, a natural idea, natural law idea. Uh, for example, uh, John Rawls uh, points out in his uh, theory of justice that uh, it is the primary subject of justice that a uh, basic structure of a society uh, shall be conserved. And uh, the fundamental rights and duties of a uh, individuals uh, shall be protected because uh, ju when uh, justice is uh, the major institution, all those uh, components which are uh, essential for uh, justice should also be protected. 
that is why base structure shall be protected that's a base structure idea is a, essentially a natural law idea uh, natural law primarily means that there is a higher law above the man made law it might be divine law or it might be rational law. but uh, there is a, a higher set of uh, legal principles and uh, when a when a constitution itself is a supreme there is a no higher law at all uh, that is uh, the argument by uh, justice uh, uh, an ray and uh, his company and so many other uh, minority judges in keshavananda case but uh, the majority uh, whether the majority uh, made use of this uh, natural law idea at all is a question uh, that uh, we should uh, take into consideration or uh, see when a case on the case itself is uh, projecting a natural law ideology whether uh, the uh, process judicial process or judicial reasoning was uh, based on a natural law ideology the answer is no because uh, the majority judges did not rely upon natural law ideology they simply escaped or they simply uh, uh, did not uh, deal with the natural law arguments because uh, they knew that uh, natural law arguments are uh, not a uh, very rational arguments uh, see chief justice uh, sm sikri uh, raised uh, an irresistible conclusion after re recognizing the fundamental importance of freedom of the individual indeed its inalienability the importance of economic social and political justice uh, in the preamble etc in the light of uh, all these things amendment in article 368 did not reflect a, a wide meaning to abrogate uh, the constitution altogether so indirectly he made use of a natural law idea but he did not uh, refer to that argument as a natural law idea although his argument was a natural law argument he did not refer to natural law ideas or natural law doctrines or uh, laws and various other forms That, that's a uh, peculiar see other judges uh, for example uh, uh, justice uh, shalat and grover they recognize the basic structure limitation arising out of preamble then an entire scheme of the constitution including article 368 and the structural factors like a supremacy of the constitution then a democracy federal polity etc on that basis uh, they derive basic structure don't right justice k sagade and justice mukherji they trace the constitutional values in the indigenous efforts put forward in a say tilak bill or a gandhi bill or a nehru committee report all these indigenous efforts or a congressional congress resolutions all this ultimately culminated in the present constitution and uh, uh, the idea of uh, ensuring uh, social welfare through direct control of state policy is uh, something that ought to be th that ought to be promoted through the constitution and for this purpose uh, a basic structure theory becomes inevitable so on the basis of direct principles uh, they build up uh, uh, this basic structure theory then we come across a uh, Justice uh, Jagan Mohan Reddy, he refers to history, tradition, and a constitutional structure, but he doesn't refer to the uh, natural law ideas. He refers to a lot of uh, precedents. Then uh, Justice H R Khanna, he accepted uh, the basic structure theory, uh, apprehending the abuse of uh, the power of amendment, uh, because uh, through uh, the power of amendment. The, there is the possibility of abrogation of the constitution itself and that ought to be avoided thus uh, the majority did not rely upon the natural law arguments then what about a minority see minority uh, did not uh, lose the opportunity of condemning a natural law uh, each and every judge who wrote a minority judgment they refer to natural law uh, arguments and they rejected natural law arguments uh, then uh, judges uh, an ray he discarded a uh, uh, natural uh, natural rights uh, idea uh, the constitution is a higher law and it is a, a form which makes a, a possible the attribution to it 
of a uh, entirely a new set of validity and uh, uh, there is a no higher law above the constitution that is his uh, logic then uh, 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 of course uh, justice uh, palekar he views that uh, idea of a uh, natural rights put forward uh, several uh, centuries ago is uh, irrelevant in the modern times that is why we want to reject that because the natural right theory has uh, caused much damage by upholding property rights etc then a uh, justice take uh, a matthew uh, see take a matthew's uh, judgment is a uh, uh, very enlightening see uh, he makes a distinction between natural law and natural law doctrines natural law doctrines sometimes uphold the property rights sometimes uphold the church's uh, special status and uh, uh, they uh, sometimes uphold uh, the rule of the king etc but natural law uh, which is a in the sense of a living embodiment of a collective reason of civilized man mankind this kind of natural law has a uh, objective factors and uh, it has a relevance in the constitutional interpretation while natural law has a relevance natural law doctrines or uh, ideologies or uh, iniquitous uh, forms of iniquitous uh, shades of a uh, natural law are uh, uh, to be excluded uh, because uh, natural law doctrines had uh, uh, upheld slavery or employers rights or patriarchy etc they are not uh, uh, relevant uh, at present then uh, uh, justice uh, mh big mh big refers to dubious distinction in natural law between uh, worthy and unworthy causes see natural law stands for for uh, some worthy causes sometimes it stands for unworthy causes that's why you uh, reject uh, the natural law ideas uh, altogether uh, does uh, the argument based on uh, natural law limitations inherent limitations uh, was rejected by justice big see same justice big justice mh big in a manaka gandhi case makes a 180 degrees a uh, change total u turn and uh, he makes uh, this observation in a uh, manaka gandhi case the idea of a natural law as a morally inescapable postulate of a just order recognizing the inalienable and inherent rights of all men which term includes a women as equals before the law persists natural law persists it is i think embodied in our constitution natural law is embodied in our constitution i am emphatically of opinion that a divorce between natural law and our constitution law will be disastrous see the person who had made uh, that observation in keshavananda arrived at this conclusion it will defeat one of the basic purpose of our uh, constitution thus uh, uh, on a uh, use of natural law Uh, there was a different provision than uh, justice y v chandrachud uh, he considered that uh, uh, indian constitution had not adopted uh, natural law ideas whether in a cad or in a text of the constitution we did not have come across any supporting factor for a adoption of natural law thus uh, the question of uh, its application doesn't arise of course uh, we come across uh, subsequent uh, judgments in a uh, indira gandhi case uh, we come across a uh, uh, mh big's uh, reference to john db's idea that uh, effective forces that uh, determine the legal sovereignty of the authority is a uh, neither union nor states nor the organs of the state uh, nor the organs of the constitution nor the constitution not even natural law but the forces that produced these agencies or institutions so those forces which have produced these institutions that uh, ought to be considered as uh, the uh, key factors then ir coelho case again a uh, non application of the theory as a, a theory uh, uh, of uh, natural rights uh, 
that we come across uh, that proposition. See, uh, about the basic structure of the theory, uh, in a, a M. Nagaraj, Justice uh, S. H. Kapadia makes a, a very important observation. That he points out that a basic structure theory is based on the argument of structuralism and it is not based upon a natural law ideas, etc. Uh, principles of federalism, secularism, reasonableness, socialism, they are beyond the words of a particular provision. They are systematic and structural principles underlying and connecting various provisions of the constitution. They, they give coherence to the constitution. They make the constitution an organic whole. Thus, uh, all these factors are to be taken into consideration. Uh, whether a natural law can uh, be used as a, a tool in interpreting Article 359 of the Constitution was uh, an issue in an ADM Jablu Professor Shukan Shukla. Uh, sole dissenting judgment of uh, uh, Justice H.R. Kanna points out that uh, uh, the amendment to uh, MISA there is a Maintenance of Internal Security Act, uh, which uh, uh, provides that no person, including a foreigner, detained under this act shall have any right to personal liberty by virtue of natural law or common law. See, for the first time, we come across the uh, use of the word natural law in one of the statute. And uh, they wanted to exclude habeas corpus uh, remedy even on uh, that ground. See, Regarding this, uh, Justice Kanna views that uh, uh, this section would not detract from my conclusion that uh, Article 21 is uh, not the sole repository of the right to personal liberty. Of course, he said that uh, personal liberty, right to life, and uh, inalienable rights are not gifts of the state. They are anterior to the constitution before, or uh, they were prevalent in a pre-law society and uh, continue in the uh, legal system. And uh, 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 of course, uh, that's how that approach was adopted. Uh, see, in a Manaka Gandhi case, uh, as you are aware, uh, the court said, uh, the procedure established by law shall be just, fair, and reasonable. And uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, interpretation of Article 21 brought uh, a big change in a the constitutional jurisprudence. Because uh, using Article 14, 19, and 21 together, and uh, uh, interpreting them in the light of a uh, uh, preamble, especially uh, individual dignity, justice, liberty, equality, etc. All this had uh, brought a tremendous change, a revolutionary change, uh, both about the uh, substantial rights, positive rights, and uh, procedural rights. Uh, see, uh, when uh, so much a change uh, took place uh, in a uh, Maneka case, whether a uh, natural law was uh, used by the uh, uh, judges as a, a play, as a, a tool of reasoning, we find that except Justice M. H. Beg, no other judge relied upon a natural law theory or natural law uh, propositions or arguments. They just uh, uh, made use of Article 14, 1921, uh, relation to the preamble and uh, various precedents and uh, so many other arguments and about uh, the uh, inalienable uh, right of uh, liberty, etc. Uh, they agreed, but not on the basis of uh, natural law. See, uh, we uh, as a constitutional law students uh, have sometimes an uh, impression that, uh, uh, yes, Court has now come uh, to the sphere of a natural law for each and everything. Higher idea, higher notions, unwritten principles, and so many things are uh, absorbed. Dignity is absorbed, etc. And uh, uh, court is uh, just uh, 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 sitting in the ivory tower of a natural law itself. That argument is not correct. See, the uh, judgment in a case of Putta Swami will uh, illustrate. This particular proposition. Of course, sir, in a case of Putta Swami, case number one, almost all the judges, except Justice Chalamesh, uh, agreed with the proposition that 
right to privacy is uh, an inalienable right it is a natural right it is a traceable to human nature without this uh, right to privacy it is uh, not possible to enjoy human dignity at all that's why dignity which is uh, the uh, key concept in a preamble to the constitution is in a position to influence the whole of jurisprudence under article 21 and uh, of course uh, they consider that uh, uh, privacy is uh, not something to be carved out from the exceptions are created under so many legislations on the other hand it is an inherent right in a every human being uh, see justice uh, uh, dy chandra chud uh, who wrote a, uh, a judgment on behalf of uh, four judges including himself uh, then uh, justice uh, rf nariman then uh, justice uh, sanjay kishan kaul then uh, uh, justice uh, sapre uh, this uh, abhay Mono, uh, manohar sapre all the all these uh, judges specifically mentioned that uh, it is a natural right. But uh, did they make use of natural law ideas or natural law ideology in a projecting right to privacy? Of course, uh, they said that uh, it is a natural right. Uh, uh, see, about uh, its importance and about its basis, recognition, etc. That type of approach was uh, essential and they did it. But uh, in a Justice uh, Case Puttaswami, uh, case number two, we come across a, a structural approach relating to interpretation of a right to privacy. Of course, a right to privacy is a born out of a, a right to human dignity. About that, uh, there is no doubt. But is, what is a human dignity? See, if it is a, a natural right, inalienable right, then uh, does it become absolute right? See, if it is a natural right, uh, then uh, we cannot uh, uh, think about uh, so many other uh, limitations on that. But uh, limitations were found out. Uh, here uh, we come across uh, the observations by Justice uh, uh, Chandrachut. It's a brilliant analysis. Uh, see, uh, what is a human dignity? If a human dignity is uh, the source of a uh, right to privacy, it is also a source of limitation because a uh, human dignity itself is a well-structured concept. It is not uh, uh, providing for uh, an absolute right. What is a human dignity? Uh, there, uh, uh, he refers to the views of uh, Aaron Barak, Immanuel Kant, Ronald Dworkin, Upendra Bakshi. By using uh, the views of all these uh, scholars about uh, human dignity, and uh, his own analysis on the basis of uh, inferences from uh, human rights jurisprudence, he points out that this uh, right to privacy uh, does not become absolute because uh, human dignity is not absolute. Uh, human dignity is uh, uh, basically involving respectability. Respecting what? Respecting one's own self and uh, respecting others and respecting society. So if respect is a central theme of a dignity, uh, there ought to be autonomy on the part of individual to make a responsible choices. See, on the one hand, he has a autonomy. On the other hand, he has a responsibility. He has, a, see, right to dignity as having an intrinsic value. That's a one idea. Uh, there is a uh, one has to decide uh, for oneself, and uh, uh, of course, uh, every person uh, should have personal responsibility not only towards himself but also towards others. There's a even about euthanasia and various other things. One has to make a very very rational choices. Uh, see, uh, there's a. Human dignity uh, itself was a structure. That's why uh, right to privacy, which is based upon a human dignity, 
is not absolute right. It is also structured. That is a brilliant uh, analysis uh, in a, uh, this particular case. Uh, see how uh, from a stray references to a natural law idea that uh, this is an inalienable right. This is a natural right. Everything is uh, done for uh, the purpose of window dressing this uh, right to privacy as a part of a uh, dignity. But the court uh, goes uh, ahead, says that, uh, uh, yes, it is uh, subject to these limitations. Then we come across uh, uh, another uh, theory. There is a sociological jurisprudence. In a Chamar Bhagwala case and various other cases, uh, we come across uh, that approach. Uh, I'm um, uh, running short of time. Uh, I have to wind up. Uh, see, sociological jurisprudence, there are, uh, constitution itself is a social document. If that is the approach, then uh, 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 bringing uh, human welfare, uh, imposing uh, reasonable restrictions upon uh, various uh, abuses of rights, and uh, uh, say equal distribution of uh, wealth and uh, various uh, resources, providing for a uh, reservation, upholding of uh, the interests of uh, the vulnerable sections, uh, protecting the interests of women, children, or uh, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes or tribals, all these things uh, come under sociological jurisprudence. And in a Chamar Bhagavala case, uh, the court viewed that state action defending the weaker sections from a social injustice and all forms of exploitation and raising the standards of living of uh, the people necessarily imply that uh, economic activities uh, attired as a trade or business can be de-recognized as a trade. And a similar approach was adopted in a Fateh Chand case and other cases. And uh, uh, although uh, about the right to property, uh, some uh, wavering approaches were adopted. Ultimately, there was a, uh, a big approach uh, uh, post uh, uh, 44th Amendment. Then we come across uh, federalism as a theory. Uh, of course, uh, uh, federalism as a theory. Uh, there, uh, uh, of course, uh, the traditional concept of federalism and a modern concept of federalism. There is a uh, state right theory of federalism or a national supremacy uh, federalism and uh, subsequently cooperative federalism and collaborative federalism. Different uh, shades of uh, federalism have arisen and uh, judiciary has uh, not adhered to specific uh, theme of federalism and uh, from time to time it is uh, evolving uh, new ideas, new approaches. Similarly about the separation of powers, uh, once again uh, uh, this is a vast area where uh, uh, we find that uh, uh, the approach is uh, uh, not to uh, provide for a uh, say dominance of one organ or another organ. That is why judiciary shall respect the other organs of government and uh, uh, about the constitutional validity of legislation, there ought to be such a fair principle approach. Uh, yes. Then uh, secularism, that is also another idea, another theme that a theory has its own influence upon a, a constitutional interpretation. But again, uh, so many other shades of a secularism, the court did not agree. The court uh, uh, insisted on or uh, relied on the constitutional uh, uh, concept of uh, secularism. There is uh, Article 25, 26, uh, 14, 15. Uh, there is a composite uh, relations uh, among, among various uh, rights. Uh, these were taken into account, whether it is a hijab or a case shawl or so many other things. These are uh, something to be uh, decided under the light of uh, the spirit of uh, the constitution, uh, not a, a specific constitutional theory, dogmatism, traditionalism, or such a thing. There ought to be an open minded approach. Thus, uh, uh, overall, what we find is that uh, the uh, approach of uh, the uh, uh, Indian judiciary is uh, one of uh, uh, keeping itself uh, uh, distant from uh, various uh, constitutional theories, but uh, gathering support from uh, all these uh, constitutional theories uh, simultaneously. It, it, it did not eschew or it did not discard. It uh, made use of uh, these uh, theories, but it uh, did not uh, uh, say fetter its uh, hands uh, to any of uh, the theory or uh, uh, it did not a uh, straight jacket. Uh, with this, I am concluding. Uh, thank you very much. I have taken a, a more time. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, there could have been a, a, 
some scope for uh, discussion, perhaps in uh, uh, some future uh, uh, class or, uh, or say on an individual basis, uh, there could be such a discussion. With this, uh, let me thank uh, Professor uh, Chidananda Reddy for uh, giving uh, this uh, uh, very good opportunity of uh, uh, sharing my thoughts on uh, uh, this uh, uh, important area of uh, uh, interpretation. Usually, about uh, theory and interpretation, uh, uh, I mean, the constitutional scholars do not uh, write much, yeah, yeah, especially in the uh, Indian uh, context. But uh, in uh, uh, other uh, countries, uh, uh, there are such uh, discussions. But uh, uh, this, I, I thought that uh, there should be some amount of uh, probing on this. Uh, this, let me conclude. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, with your, <clears throat> with your permission, sir, there is one question in the chat box. Uh, uh, despite uh, uh, the fact that uh, we have run out of time, uh, if you can quickly considering, uh, consider answering this. Can judges' interpretation change with the changing social needs and situations provided the words of a particular statute remain safe? Uh, this is... Uh, uh, a question that is there in the chat box by Anuradha Vastra. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, constitutional interpretations uh, change from uh, time to time. Uh, for example, about the uh, procedure research by law, there was a big change after Maneka Gandhi case. Uh, yes, the social context and various uh, other circumstances uh, actually. Uh, demanded uh, that kind of interpretation and there was uh, that change. Uh, yes, sir. that particular uh, proposition that uh, uh, judges uh, uh, do change uh, their uh, views about uh, the meanings of uh, uh, provisions of the constitution from uh, time to time according to the circumstance, etc. Uh, there is not, uh, uh, say, some uh, uh, adverse remark about uh, the judicial wavering or uh, such a thing. On the other hand, when uh, circumstances demand uh, such changes uh, will have to be introduced, that is uh, quite appropriate. Yes, uh, yes. yes uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for your insightful lecture. I now request Professor Dr. C.S. Patil, Head Research Center and Professor of Law to kindly propose the vote of thanks. Please, sir. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is, in fact, uh, a very pleasurable and celebrious occasion for us in the KSLU Law School and also in the Center for Research in Democracy and Constitutional Government because this is the first of the <coughs> lecture series that we have embarked upon. <coughs> and it is so nice. Uh, to have this special lecture by our Honorable Vice Chancellor, who is a uh, mountain in the field of uh, uh, constitutional law. He has done a very serious research in this area. And uh, in days to come, uh, probably that will be available in print for, for all of us as a uh, basic material for reference. And I am not going to uh, uh, take you through what all the uh, things our Honorable Vice Chancellor has taken us through. It was really a feast. As a student of constitutional law, and again back, sitting in front of uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, under whom I had the privilege of grooming myself, so I was thinking uh, I was feeling that I am back in the Department of Law, Mysore University, sitting in front of Professor Ishwar, but being introduced to these highly novel ideas. Otherwise, we had no reason to think about these dimensions. Sir, thank you very much on behalf of everyone concerned here. Uh, you have given us such wonderful uh, dimensions of the constitutional uh, theories, the classification of theories, how they are used, and how Indian judiciary as uh, uh, having derived strength from each of these uh, theories, how it has maintained that discrete detachment, uh, yes, keeping yes, itself yes. all options uh, yes. to explore in the days to come. And uh, when it is initiated by uh, a professor like 
Professor Ishwar, but I hope the series will go on very well, wherein we will be having scholarly lectures uh, by eminent people in the field of law. On this occasion, <clears throat> I thank our honorable registrar, Sri Mahamad Zubair, our registrar evaluation, Professor G.B. Patin, our Dean and Director, Dr. Ratna Bharamagaudar, who all have collaborated in organizing this series of lectures uh, in this effective manner. Uh, please bear with me. I have to acknowledge the presence of certain of the people here on the platform. We have uh, Professor S. V. Nardgaudar, former Dean of Bangalore University. We have uh, Professor S. S. Patundi from Department of Political Science, former Dean of uh, uh, the uh, Karnataka University, Darwad, who was the registrar of Rani Chanama University also. We have uh, Dr. Vismi Gopalakrishnan, who is the Dean uh, Mahatma Gandhi University uh, court IM, who is present here. And, and we have uh, our former registrar, Major Siddhalingaya Hiramat, uh, present on this occasion with us. And uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Shethi Skoda from uh, Bangalore University, advocates Dr. Jagdish Alchetti, Rutunjaya Halikiri. We have principals, several principals here present, Dr. Rupa Ingrali, Dr. Naji Gunisa, Dr. Jayasimma, Dr. Preeti Desai, Dr. Anjana Reddy and others, and innumerable faculty members from various colleges who are associated with us. Second Saturday, despite being a holiday, we felt we will make good use of this time and really the causes served well. So when people are taking rest, 276 people gathered on the online platform. Uh, on this occasion, I uh, repeat uh, the poem of S.W. Longfellow, those heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight. They were toiling upward in the night when their companions slept. Whether our companions have slept or not, we are awake learning something on this second Saturday. I thank each and everyone who is on the platform for being associated with us. I wish all of you the very best. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. I once again thank all the dignitaries, faculties, and students for being part of this special lecture series. Thank you, everyone. I wish everyone a very good day. Thank you. So with that, we adjourn. Thank you very much.